So the question is, what further needs to be done? Yeah, well, I'm, that's that's what I'm not exactly sure of myself. If I were sure of that, I'd probably write it myself. Um, but the fact that I'm uh, there are two reasons I'm not writing. Uh, one, I don't want to attend to the stuff that's been written in the past. I don't want to mess with that junk. Uh, and not all of it's junk, but I don't want to deal with that. I, it isn't worth it. Uh, and the other is that I no longer have the time blocks. I don't want to take the time blocks. I don't think it's worth my effort, given the fact that 40 years of my life was given to it anyway. Uh, and somebody else has to carry it on. Uh, and I don't think that I want to take time to do that kind of thing. I, I, you know, I've done a hell of a lot, so to speak. And that's why I want to get the framework. Maybe framework is a better word than grammar. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I need, the framework needs to be out there so people can see this is the work that needs to be done and this is the piece of it that I can do. Uh, and there is a difference between the kind of work that needs to be done at the dissertation scholarly level and how it relates to practice, and I'm aware of that as a problem. So people who go on for doctorates just to get the degree so they can go back to practice, we shouldn't be wasting our time on them. Somebody else ought to be wasting their time on them. Uh, if there are, the, the fact that the educational, the curriculum field is not a scholarly field is a problem, but it's no much more of a problem than other practical fields that also lack a historical focus. Uh, and part of the needed scholarliness in the professional fields is somebody who has the time and the resources to do that historical digging. And if an institution cannot provide the financing for that kind of scholarly work, then the doctoral students in their dissertations need to do it before they go out back into practice. That's the only place where I see that. Now, it would be great if somebody could sponsor a 10-year scholarly historical, that's not going to happen. Because people who investing in education, again, want quick, easy solutions, which is stupid. Which and that, is, can I relate that to the church? In the sense oh, yeah, no, I agree. I, I agree with you. Thing. Oh, no, I agree with you. Right, okay. oh, I agree with you on that. Okay. Uh, the, that's uh, we, we're, we are in a historical culture, uh, and that is a major problem. Because our problems are historically determined, and they can only be solved with historical consciousness. Mm. So, before I turn on the table, mm -hmm. you're talking about your expansiveness in writing. The, about what? Your expansiveness. Oh, right? okay. That literally there will be a lecture that I have been to the last few months, at least, that I cannot think of something a quote of yours in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you see the continuation of your work, when you talk about framework, but a continuation of your work since your work covered so much? I don't, I can't answer that, I don't know. I, yeah, okay. I, no, that's, that's one of the problems. Uh, uh, again, what, I, what happens, or what has happened, is that particular pieces have been taken out and developed further. And so Mike is a good illustration of Mike has indeed attended the political, in a sense, the economic aspects of it. Uh, and I think probably in his work with teachers, he probably develops that kind of consciousness within teachers. I'm not sure of that. Uh, but then he doesn't deal, in a sense, with the larger um, existential questions or the ontological questions or the epistemological questions. And he doesn't deal with the content questions except in that narrow range of political economy. Uh, uh, but what we're talking about is indeed the way science is also being taught and why didn't the Conant focus back at Harvard back in the 30s where he was dealing with the history of science why hasn't that been a major focus in some ways because it's crucial so to speak and if I were to go back and teach you know in some place like Teachers College uh, whereas Arno was, you know, doing some historical work. <clears throat> I would, and, and if Larry Kremen were to ask me again, would, could I help you develop historical skills? I would say, by all means, now you could, because now I know what the problems are. Then I didn't know what the problems were, and to get caught in the historical stuff, I would have been dealing with uh, stuff that really wasn't as important. Even though Larry's first book was important, his other books have not been that important. So, 
And I don't know who's doing good history of education. Well, that's not true. I know Tyak has done something on history of uh, educational in innovation. I don't know how good it is, I, because I don't look at that. But I don't know who else is doing that kind of work. Uh, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't seem like you had an agenda with your scholarship either. I, mean, you I didn't have an agenda. I was, I was, but my curiosity was not necessarily driven just about a curiosity about education. My interest in education was that I was curious about the human, about myself as a human being and other people as human beings. And one way of giving that form was indeed to focus upon education. And it isn't that I have been driven uh, simply by uh, comprehension, the ability to comprehend education. It's been my effort to try to comprehend the nature of human life. And uh, uh, and that I probably could have found in other fields, and I clearly find it in in the ministry. Uh, you know, there's no question about that. Uh, if I were in that field, um, I am I am very glad that I did not become a scientist uh, in when I had chemical capabilities or engineering capabilities because the interest in developing simply scientific theories or technologies doesn't deal with the human experience necessarily. Now it could and it should, but it doesn't. Uh, so I'm really glad that I somehow or another found education as a way of exploring what it means to be a human being. Yeah, and not too many educators take advantage of that opportunity. That's it, yeah. Because I went to seminary, I mean, that's one reason I went to seminary, right? And my, yeah, my, yeah. my religious tradition yeah. is to understand humanity. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. And, and there, certainly that's true of a lot of people in the ministerial field or in the theological field. I don't have any question about that. Not all of them, but many of them that I know of. Yeah. I've, Ellen has a student that we worked with. I say we because she became our gardener for a while. Um, and she's a Roman Catholic studied for the MDiv, um, and she would come over and garden, and Ellen would talk about what she wanted to do, you know, what, what she can do with her education. And after a period of maybe a year or so, she was aware that what she was interested in cooking, and she said, what I really want to be able to do is to cook for the dying. Wow. You know, just tremendous, uh, which it seems to me is a continuation of this searching what is the meaning? How do I make meaning out of my life? To cook for the dying, my God. And so she tried it here with the hospital and some of her connections fell flat for a variety of reasons, not, not of her making. Mm -hmm. uh, she, and she wanted to go to New York. And I don't know how she found the connections, but she's working for a uh, priory and a Catholic order of Dominicans, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, who have a variety of jobs, some of them in a local parish, some of them at the hospital, two of them dying. And she is their weekend cook and is now finding a vehicle where she can gradually broaden that whole concern out. And that, that carries with it the same kind of curiosity about, you know, what can I do? And Ellen does the same thing. Ellen, in terms of, is, is not just a typical Old Testament scholar. She is constantly into new areas, pushing both the Old Testament and pushing her own awareness. So her interest in South Africa, in Sudan, her interest in agriculture, her interest in Jewish-Christian Muslim dialogues, uh, her, Christ, her interest in African interpretation of the Bible, all of that is life-giving. I guess that's the answer. Uh, not too many professions are life-giving. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And life-giving means what the hell is it all about? You know, not just joy, uh, but the pain and the, everything that goes with life-giving. Yes. Were you an, always an original thinker? or an original I have no idea. I, I just don't know. I, when I was in my junior college chemistry, I was certainly supported by the chemistry faculty and one of the chemical chemistry teachers who was an organic chemist said, geez, you ought to be a research chemist. Now, you know, I don't know whether I, I was curious at that time and I was self-motivated in the science area. I taught myself the calculus. I, you know, did a lot of things. And uh, 
I've done my own work in, in uh, photography and things like that. But so yeah, I've been curious, um, but I don't know if I've ever been. I'd, I would not have normally identified myself as creative. I wouldn't have identified myself as creative either as a person at Teachers College, mm -hmm. although I'm aware that my work is indeed unique and quite different than mm -hmm. creative, but I don't, I don't see myself as a creative person. I see myself as a questioning person, as a doubting person, uh, and uh, uh, very much aware of the false consciousness of a hell of a lot of people around me. But, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I want to get back to, I mean, in the short span that we've been in person, you're a very strong individual. Um, oh. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're strong, and you're a very strong person. Um, it, it, is, it would not be, in my opinion, common for, for, for a person to be able to say uh, F off to people who disagreed with them, to, to maintain going upstream whenever you know, everything's bad. Where does that come from? Where does that... Oh, I was, um, I was um, fortunate, uh, again, you know, you almost look at it as a kind of grace, I guess. Um, I was not a well-adjusted kid. Uh, I did not run with a group. Uh, I was not interested in socializing and dancing. I was pretty much an isolate. Uh, which means essentially that I was freed from other people's expectations and the, the need to go along with them. I, I was outside uh, and I have probably always been that way, uh, which is one of the reasons I didn't get married until I was in my 40s, uh, you know. And then I only got married because I managed some pretty intensive psychotherapy for a while. Uh, I committed myself uh, very early in my life. I am not going to have a family and have raised kids. And I have great respect for my parents. They raised me well. I don't, that's not a comment. But I don't want to live, uh, to go through life raising kids the way I and many of the people I know were raised. Um, Would you like to spend on that? Like how? What are you doing? Well, I'm not sure about that. I just know that my childhood, whereas it was a good childhood up until the Depression, mm -hmm. it was a miserable childhood after that. Uh, and I was really, I had been wounded uh, in both because of the loss of our house and because of, you know, the other things in the Depression. And I simply didn't want to get other people caught up in that kind of, uh, I shouldn't say unhappiness, but I, because I wasn't unhappy necessarily. Uh, I didn't want the people caught up in some of the shit that I was caught up in, I guess that's the simplest way. Uh, and consequently, I did not develop uh, really good social skills. Uh, I was probably atypical socially uh, and was indeed, was and still is uh, an introvert uh, of the first water. Uh, so I could care less about what some people think. Uh, uh, you know, that could be a character flaw, but it could also be a character strength. And I probably turned it into a character strength in terms of okay, I, I have to think for myself, I'm going to be responsible for myself. And I didn't marry until I was 44 uh, for the first time. And that, I was not capable of a real uh, interpersonal relationship uh, earlier uh, until I had some very extensive psychotherapy. Mm. Uh, I had relationships, but I can't say that they were truly uh, uh, interpersonal exchanges of, of an emotionally meaningful kind. So yeah. that's probably the essential source of that. It's probably my neuroses that have given me the strength to say, the hell we all, uh, you know, I'm going to do my own work. 
And at the same time, when I was at Teachers College, I never was obnoxious in that sense. I, you know, I respected the people I was working with. I got along with them. I worked with them. I did committee work well. Uh, but when it came to my intellectual work, uh, when I started reading and religious literature or mystical literature, uh, you know, I didn't care what other people wanted me to read. At the age of 44, where were you professionally? I'm not sure you I was, uh, had become already an associate professor with tenure. I was given tenure within the first four or five years of teacher's college. Completely different worlds. Oh yeah, totally, yes. totally different, yeah. No, that can't happen today. Did you ever feel like you had to sacrifice areas of your life for your profession, such hmm. as your family and so forth? No. Were you intentional about that? Well, uh, no, I can't say that I was intentional, but I'm sure that that's one of the reasons I married late. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I married late, which meant that I was well established professionally, mm -hmm. and I could devote my energies to family, mm -hmm. uh, and I never felt a split. The only time that split happened is when we moved to Connecticut, when, and it's at that point that my marriage began to fall apart. And I, I, my my first wife in New York had been teaching at a, a at a really good private school, and we were using her income to pay my kids' college or er, uh, school tuition, and we were quite well, doing quite well together. And when we moved to Connecticut, I was aware that my new work was going to be really time consuming, and I think I probably said I need to be able to devote as much energy as I can to this work and we will have to think later about your work and what you're going to do. Now whether that was something that contributed to the divorce or whether there are other factors because there are other factors that I'm aware of I'm not sure but no I never so I, I my work was did begin to sacrifice under the tensions and turmoil and pain of a divorce uh, but that wasn't intentional. That was, <laughs> you know, that, the way those things go. You know, right. so. Well, many times nowadays people will talk about that as far as sacrificing everything to get tenure. Because the, the I have never years. sacrificed everything for my job. Okay. I I attended my job, uh, but I also made sure that I had a life, and particularly the family life. But when I had kids, I remember. Uh, being good friends with a historian at Teachers College, John Miserly, uh, who became president of um, one of the Pennsylvania colleges. I forgot which one. He was a historian who had uh, done his dissertation, I think, on Horace Mann. He also had a house up in the country. And he and I both would spend time in the summer Rather than doing scholarly work, we would rebuild our houses, you know. Mm -hmm. And Larry Kremen was furious at him. He would say, you know, John, why don't you stop working on your house and do your scholarship? Well, nobody ever told me that. Partially because the Department of Curriculum Teaching was not a scholarly community in terms of writing. Mm -hmm. our, work was, uh, our work was teaching and our work was making sure that our students got a good education. But the scholarliness, the writing was not not crucial. If it had been crucial, I'm not sure that it would have gone in the same way. So my uh, my writing comes not out of demand to write, but the fact that I either was invited to lecture or had things to say or something like that. So I, 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 be, I have really become aware of the scholarly demands through my life with Ellen. Uh, I mean, she is a true scholar and um, she, that is a priority for her. Our, our family life is too, but our no family life is not complicated because I'm retired and we do not have children that we have to raise. So, but she, uh, she won't take a you know a day off without working. Uh, she doesn't want. We don't vacation. She'd rather write. <laughs> yeah, and I don't mind. Uh, and we talked about earlier her writing skills. She find writing she enjoy writing. Oh well, she was. Uh, 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 she graduated from college when she was 16, went to Berkeley, and uh, did a program in, uh, in uh, humanities. And one of her teachers was uh, 
Fox, the translator of the bio, of the Old Testament, in a fine. Uh, and so I think she has always probably been a tr has been helped along the way to be a really fine writer. She has a, f a great background in Latin, great grammarian, corrects my errors uh, too often, uh, and writes very slowly but thinks very carefully. Uh, and so she isn't one who sits down and dashes off you know, three pages a night, she might spend an, a whole day on one page, something like that. And then she always rewrites it. And when she's asked to preach, she will prepare her sermon anywhere from a month to two months ahead of time, and then will rewrite it probably twice before she delivers it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and she couldn't do that if she were a full-time preacher, of course. You know, but she's aware of that. Right. But she's a model for the students in terms of the quality of her preaching. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, very, I'm much more aware of the scholarly demands, uh, which were not the case when I was growing up at Teachers College or at Northern Illinois. We were, we were hired to be teachers and thinkers, but not necessarily writers. This is a what if question, um, so take it as you will. Would, would you have been interested at teaching at Union? I ask this because you made it clear your intentions of leading Teachers College. Did you also have that same feeling about Union, it was time to go, or would you have taken a full-time position at Union? If well, Union, offered, yeah. If it was available. Oh, no, I, it would never have been available to me. Yes, I, okay. No, no, I'm, I know, there's no question about that. Okay. Uh, because, for one reason, uh, when Ellis Nelson retired, the, the dean or the president of Union asked me to be on the committee to find a replacement. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I was respected for my commitments to religious education, but they knew that I did not have the biblical or theological capabilities. And I might simply have glazed over the eyes of the people at Yale, for all I know. I, you know, I had enough reputation in the field and got enough. Uh, Barbara Wheeler was a strong supporter of mine. Uh, and when I went to Yale, uh, one of the first persons I met was Bob Lynn, who at that time was at the Lilly Foundation. He said, Dwayne, I'm so glad you're here. If there's anything I can do for you, let me know. Um, so, you know, I, so they, they uh, were aware that I didn't have a formal education. I had an informal education of theology, not an informal education in, in biblical studies. My biblical, my son-in-law with his evangelical tradition is a better biblical reader than I am, but it's a biblical reading in English, and <laughs> so I occasionally raise questions about his interpretations and then said, you need to talk to Ellen. <laughs> How did you feel about teaching at a, a seminary whenever you yourself didn't go to seminary formally and so forth? Was there any other uh, Yeah, no, I had, I had qualms about that. Uh, And yet, I, again, I was well enough known in the field of religious education by that time that almost everybody in major positions in, the, in religious education knew of me one way or the other. Um, not that they all would have identified with me or supported the way I moved, but they at least knew of me and in some ways had to be accountable uh, to my critiques. Like Ellis Nelson took a strong position on uh, religious education as a socialization activity. Mm -hmm. And I uh, really critiqued him uh, seriously, and he very responsive to it. Uh, and not much of religious education required a strong theological or biblical foundation. That's the other part of it. And when I taught religious education at Yale, I drew upon uh, people who were writing in the field of Bible and education, uh, you know, I don't remember the names, Moss was one of them, but there are other people who did that. So I could draw upon their work and look at, and uh, I'd had enough experience with Walter to know enough about some Bible forms of teaching and so. Did any students give you hassle or anything? Or no, they... no. I'm, I'm sure some students stayed away from me, but they never gave me a hassle. Yeah. Uh, and, and as in most seminaries, the religious education is not something that most people want to mess with anyway. They'd rather get at the hard stuff. 
The only reason they do that is somebody asked them to do religious education, take care of youth. And I used to comment, that's a hell of a way to, for youth leaders to be, uh, the experienced pastors ought to be the youth leaders, not the incoming junior faculty, uh, ministers. So, and, and I used to say that the major problem in religious education is because the sermons are so damn bad. Why don't you increase the quality of sermons so you arouse some curiosity so there's a need for religious education? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would say that quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I still think that's the case. Yeah. It's not the only problem, but that's one of them. Well, yeah, preaching definitely is an issue. Mm -hmm. We talked about this already. You mentioned this. So this is just time. If you want to expand, you can. Uh, do you have any regrets personally or professionally? No. No. I led, in a sense, a, a very uh, ideal professional life. I had great opportunities, and uh, I had some hard times, but I don't have any regret. I wouldn't do anything. If I were to begin my career over again, I wouldn't do it, but that's because the culture has changed, too. Uh, but if... Looking back at the very beginning, I don't regret any decision that I made. Uh, I'm glad that I went to teach at college rather than Berkeley. Uh, I don't regret having retired early. I'm really pleased that Yale had the courage to do what they did. Uh, in what sense, maybe? In terms of inviting me to teach. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it was a pretty gutsy decision on the part of the dean. And the dean did it over the resistance of some of his biblical scholars. Really? Oh, I know that, yeah. Wow. Oh. Did they, did the faculty at Yale resist you whenever you became an administrator? No. Oh, no, 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 there was no problem. So once no. you got into that, Yeah, no, there was no problem. No, no, the, uh, it was the junior faculty members who were uh, really scholarly types. And my, and Lee Keck said to me, don't pay any attention to the Dwayne. They're not going to make the decision. You know? So I, you know, Lee was really great. So, and when I went through the divorce, I really felt sorry for the institution because I couldn't devote the kind of time and energy that I needed to. And Lee said, "All you need to do for religious education is to do what you've done for your field: write one or two articles that made to make make a big difference." And I don't know whether I did that. I, you know, I did. Some of them, but I'm not sure. Not as much as I would have wanted to do, I, because I was on the track for doing other things, and I was waylaid, waylaid by the divorce, and then waylaid by administration. Mm -hmm. oh. So this is a bit touchy subject, maybe, but in a correspondence we have in the archival collection that you sent, uh, I believe it's from you to Pinar, but it's definitely from you. You apologize in the letter for being ca uh, callous. Can you clarify by what No, I have no uh, I have no idea whatever did, did you ever think of yourself as callous? Or? No, I don't remember ever saying anything like that. That's interesting. That isn't that's why I, I don't find you to be callous is my point, yeah. So I found that peculiar um and your writing. Well, I, that could have been a reference to you know the fact that I wasn't paying that much attention to Bill's writing. Mm. I'm not sure that that's the case, but I don't remember ever making a statement like that. I I think I've apologized maybe not directly, but indirectly to both Mike and to Bill for not reading their work and responding to it. Uh, whether I would have identified that as callous or not, I don't know, but I wasn't interested in reading it. I find it boring uh, after a while. That's all my questions so far. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>